In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, O God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere, prisoner, of of all things, treasure of bliss, and hero of life, come and abide in sequences who may be impure, and save our souls, a good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, into the age of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, and save us. Amen. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm glad you're here today. We'll, uh, we'll have a little bit of a different topic. Uh, Father Matthew was not able to join us. He had some uh, things he had to attend to. But uh, today we'll talk about a specific topic regarding the uh, some of the, the questions we had recently. So we I promised you we'll talk about this. There are actually two, two themes we want to cover. Why is animal blood used in the Old Testament, and why did God, why uh, did God not just forgive our sins, but He had to be crucified? And the other question is, God's punishing us for the sins of our parents and predecessors. So I hope we can try to give uh, maybe not an academic, but rather catechetical answer to these two questions. Let me just share my screen with you, and we'll uh, go from there. Then we'll uh, move on to the other topic as well. Um, the computer is a little bit slow, but we will uh, start very soon. Uh, we'll take some. Just a second. Of course, when we uh, try to when we finish with this uh, topic, you're most welcome to, if you have any questions, to feel free to answer, to, to participate. Or you can turn that off in there. I'm a ground user and listen. Yeah. The reading view. So you can mute yourself for, for the time being, and then we will, um, uh, God willing, we'll continue when, uh, if you in the meantime have uh, something to ask. Let me just, uh, I'm, I'm, please, I apologize for my computer is very slow because it's recording at the same time and also streaming. So we'll hope that uh, we'll get there soon. So anyway, we can start by simply um, asking the question, why is animal blood used in the Old Testament? Why did God, not just uh, being God, omnipotent, all-merciful, all-forgiving, all-love, just forgive a sins, but he had to go through this whole process of suffering betrayal, torture, and death on the cross, a humiliating, excruciating, in pain death. So today we'll try to answer one important question that you might uh, be asked, for example, by someone who does not know our Orthodox faith, or maybe they know just a little bit, but there, it's, this question is maybe not very clear to them. So for that reason, we'll try to answer uh, this question. Let me just see someone. Okay, let's mute it. Why could God not forgive all our sins, for example? Why his son had to come amongst us? Why did he have to humiliate himself to the point he will be beaten, spit on, tortured, betrayed, be crucified on the cross? and die on it. Why did all of this have to happen, and he did not want to, let's say, simply forgive us? After all, the logic uh, tells, allows us to think that he can do anything, so this shouldn't be a problem for him. Why did he have to go through this humiliating process? 
And the answer is very simple. Only forgiveness is not enough for us. What we need for salvation to be able to become free from sin and to follow the Lord and to live for him and with him, we need much more than just, let's say, forgiveness. And I here have on the slide something from what we believe maybe it was St. Paul who wrote the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the, corner, the, the commerce thereunto perfect. But then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had more, no more conscious of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. An average man who does not know about God very much, who has not heard about our Lord Jesus Christ as our God, is something... Uh, hard for him to to fend, uh, to understand Christ, especially the sacrificial offering that he does. Because most people imagine God as personless being, some powerful and terrible force maybe, understandably transcended, who lives beyond and above our comprehension, who seems that sometimes he has no interest in us. This, for example, you remember Descartes, I think that means that I exist, the existentialists, the philosophers, the atheists of today, the agnostics, and even sometimes religions like uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and so forth, they talk about the oneness, this formless God who is at the same time formless, transcendent, and also a form of all the existence at the same time. To this person or to these people who think like that, who are not Christians, that is what God uh, very often looks like. This is essential contradiction from our understanding and knowing of God. Some even say that this kind of God, who humiliates himself so much, allows to be spit on, to be beaten, to be crucified, cannot be even invented nor imagined, because this might be contradictory amongst you who are a little bit older, for example, and still remember how, for example, uh, some of you who have read the history of the, let's say, the ex-communist countries, because I remember very well, uh, the, the communists used to teach us that people invented God, and therefore, hence, we have the religion as the opium for the people. Yes, it is true that many gods are fruit of people's imagination, that they were imagined, but you cannot invent a, our God even if you wanted to. A God who descends on earth to become like one of us and to give himself unto death. This kind of God never existed or has been part of any culture, religious culture and understanding until he himself revealed to us and we were able to see and understand. But let us, um, uh, let us come back to our question about forgiveness. That why, uh, as we asked at the very beginning, God did not just forgive all of us and we can just go along with that. Imagine one of the Old Testament prophets, like, for example, I don't know, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, whomever you want, to proclaim to the Israel that God, because of his great mercy and compassion, decided unconditionally, without the need of their repentance, or even asking for forgiveness, to forgive all of their sins. To simply tell them, for example, everything is clear from now on. All is forgiven. Imagine if someone like I don't know, in our church, because the founder of the Serbian church is Sen Sava, who, uh, just a little brief uh, information about him, he was a prince who decided to become a monk. He went for the monastery. When his father found out about that, he, uh, of course, was against that idea, and it took him some time for him, to, for him to understand the need, the reason why his son went to the monastery, but he created a kevok at the time. So imagine, like, Someone like Sensava, and later he, he, we call him the father, the founder of the Serbian Orthodox Church from the 12th century. Let's say if he would proclaim to all the Serbian people, or we can have Saint Nina of Georgia, it doesn't matter, so that we can all here understand very clearly that God has forgiven, let's say, all of our sins. All the murders, adultery, the lying, the theft, the superstition, the adoption of godless ideologies, 
the following of the false gods, that we cursed him with our lips, him and his mother. As you know, for some of you who, uh, let's say, know come from the, in Eastern Europe, the communists were very efficient on brainwashing the people that sometimes even uh, was a normal thing to curse against God or, or the saints. And let's say that uh, someone like Sensawa tells, okay, now he's forgiving all of you. Let me ask you now, how many people would you think that will be thrilled and amazed by this to the point that they would leave their sinful life and their worldly passions and would start to follow the Lord's commandment if God would simply forgive their sins? No questions asked. No requirements for repentance. No need for uh, understanding the, the meaning and the depth of the sin and what sin actually produces which is spiritual death. I would dare to think a very small number of people, of course. What would most people do instead? They might go even worse. They might sin even more, knowing that God will forgive no matter what, not knowing what the eternal consequences to him or her would be. In other words, forgiveness itself is not enough for us. Even in the Old Testament, our Lord God points out something that is the following. Namely, he's asking from the Jewish people that he chose, chosen people as we call them, for their sins to offer innocent, pure, and young animals. Uh, and uh, he, very strangely enough, he wants to see their blood. Then we ask ourselves, why would God, who is a spirit, want the blood of the young and innocent animals? But he already tells beforehand that someone must pay heavily for their sins. And to the people of Israel, he teaches them that those animals with whom they live and are dependent on, that they use to, to, for survival, basically, that they have to slaughter them uh, every time when they commit a sin. Meaning that every time when someone sins, someone innocent will have to pay. Just as when we get drunk and we know that we should not drink and drive, but alas, we still sit drunk behind the steering wheel and then, God forbid, create an accident and someone gets killed. Because sometimes it's more dangerous when people sit like that behind the wheel, knowing they shouldn't drink, they not might hurt themselves, themselves but someone else. You see what is the consequences of sin. He's teaching them, God, to the Israeli people, that they will be, uh, so th th they would be disgusted by the fact that when they sin and darken their minds, their hearts and soul, that they will stop themselves from the realization of the fact that because of the sin they committed, they, uh, that they would have to kill an innocent animal. It was a pedagogical measure. However, they did not understand his pedagogy at all. Uh, they continued to slaughter and slaughter and would not stop themselves sinning. They said, God needs that blood, but God does not need that blood, but rather you must stop yourself from an understanding that someone innocent will have to pay for it. As we have said many times, we, when we don't deeply understand that we need to stop to sin, we basically become something that we call transactional believers. who we'll say, I'll light this many candles, I'll give this many donations, but in return, I want God to forgive me this and that, and in a reciprocity, certain sins, and or, or reward me for something that I, something more have done, and so forth. This pedagogy of the Lord, people did not understand, that they have to shed blood and, and redeem for their sins. And now, to understand, he himself had to come to reveal who and what is God like. Our understanding of God by this time, before his revelation, was completely wrong and false. Only a few people knew what God was like and why did he made us. What is this? What, what is basically, they knew what sin is, essentially. That sin is not only some overrun or some rule or let's say some small transgression or some small mistake, but rather a full darkening of our mind and soul, and that if we choose to live in its darkness, we become slaves to sins, uh, to those sins that we do, or to, or to those passions that we are uh, enslaved to. You cannot longer uh, not be able uh, to do it. The sin has started to govern us, and that is terrible. We will become enslaved to it. We're no longer free. We're no longer a son or a daughter, but slave. 
but which are the eternal consequences if, God forbid, death meet us in such simple state. Because of all this, our Lord must come and show us and to allow to be killed because of it. To enter death himself and to confront our greatest enemy, the devil, and death, who knows how much we are afraid of death. And he is constantly keeping us frightened by this death. You have 70 or 80 years, but afterwards you become food for the worms. Go and get everything what life can offer you now. When a man does not have elevated and noble, meaningful understanding of his life, which God had finally revealed to us, there is no more reason to be a mortal, ethical, to be a moral, ethical person. In that state, sin becomes familiar and relevant, becomes part of our nature in a way, unfortunately. We fall into pleasures and passions in many different evils. Our Lord Jesus Christ breaks those chains of fear with his resurrection so we won't be afraid of our death. He gives us a chance to be free from sins, believe in him, and follow him. But how did he do this through the most possible terrifying death? So terrifying that you cannot find more terrifying death than the one of the crucifixion. So there cannot be someone who might say that there might be something more terrifying death that this one that he chose something more let's say uh excruciating painful than, than the crucifixion itself you know that um uh, when people would got crucified on the cross some people who got crucified could live up to uh, many days and they would have a very painful and slow death that's why it was considered to be a mercy if some of the soldiers would pierce your body and kill you on the spot so you can bleed to death. Otherwise, uh, you will die from, uh, from uh, all the other uh, consequences of, of hanging on the cross. So he took upon himself Christ the most horrifying death so we would not be afraid of it anymore. To resurrect and to show us that the human nature is stronger than death. Through the cross, and here is now the answer to our question, why he does not simply forgive our sins, but he must go through the cross, is so that this will not pass unnoticed. If he would uh, only, let's say, I don't know, lie in bed, falling in the sleep of death, and then resurrected, we might say that this is a very ordinary, or he had some sort of a clinical experience, clinical death, like people today uh, talk about. But he goes through this terrifying crucifixion and all the drama around the cross, so that even today, so many centuries later, provokes discussion. We still talk about the event of the crucifixion. So no one can be indifferent and not notice who great is, how great is the love of God, and what is he capable to do for all of us. So we would not ever forget. This is why he goes to death through the cross, and this becomes the symbol of victory. Once what it was, the cross, the symbol of cross, a symbol of humiliation, punishment, uh, in which only the greatest criminals and the traitors of the nations or the traitors of the empire would be uh, punished by, now becomes for us because Christ is crucified and in the symbol of victory. Before that, as, as you know, it was a reminder of these horrible things. Before we were forgiven, he needed to show us that God is our father, that he loves us, and to show us all what did sin did with us. In what kind of spiritual state we are, in what kind of a spiritual decay we were, and we still are. And of course, what are the eternal consequences of the sins that we commit for all of us? He wants to heal us from it, and to help us understand that we need to ask for forgiveness, and why it is so important and necessary. What is the price of this forgiveness? It is the most expensive price. The price is the very crucifixion of the Son of God on the cross. So he would not become back to the sin and mock that very crucifixion. The forgiveness cannot look as some sort of a cheap deal. We can take it light. No. His son is paying with his blood on the cross as an innocent man just so we can be free from sin. And here comes something that is even more important than this. And comes right after the forgiveness. That is that he brought us healing. Tearing apart the very root of sin. The very reason why we sin. Among other things he came because of the fear. And the very end. I hope this question is more answered. 
But there's one prayer, if you remember, that we always say this every, uh, every time when we have any of the services, whether it's Vespers or the Lenten hours or we, during the, uh, the Orthros and so forth, and it goes like this, O most holy trinity, have mercy on us. O Lord, cleanse us our sins. Master, Father, transgression. O holy one, visit the heal and infirmities for thy name's sake. This prayer, we say every day, even, even when we do our prayer, it's part of every service, private or otherwise. But we say, have mercy on us, that when we use this prayer, we know that he is merciful, God. Because when we say, have mercy on us, we confess and admit our powerlessness. It means, please, O oh Lord, pay attention to me so you can cleanse my sins because I am in pain. I have wounds. Please heal them. This very... Uh, this is very important as a, as a process. That's why th this prayer, if you remember, we call the Trisagion. We say, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Mother, have mercy on us three times. And then we say, Glory to the Father, now and to the age of ages. And we say, Almost Holy Trinity. And then we say the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father Christ himself spoke and taught us how to, to pray to, to God the Father. But what's more very important, Christ teaches us that God is not some abstract being, but he is a person. And he calls him Father. And he becomes our father at this moment. This is very important as a process. That we have pardon of our transgressions. Cleanse our consciousness and free us from our past. So we would no longer live in the past in remembrance of our misery, but to rather look into the future. What I would like to add here in, 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 to this is to remembering the past. Someone asked the question, why do we sometimes, when I, I don't know, daydreaming or if my, I get lost in my thoughts, sometimes I feel sad because I remember the sins that I have committed, let's say, when I was a teenager, when I was younger. Even though I have confessed them, they still come back to me. It is because the devil, who doesn't know the future, he wants us to be preoccupied with the past so that we can spend all of our energy towards uh, the past, and if possible, through tickling of our fantasies, to maybe pull us back into the gravity of decay, into the gravity of sin and the spiritual death. Then at the ends of all, of all ends, what is so important in this prayer that we have in front of us is that we're asking to pluck out the root of my illness, that even when I admit that I have sins, you forgave me so I would never come back to that sin ever again. See what a therapy man needs, from pardoning up to the healing. The forgiveness only is not enough. Our Lord is ready to give us all of that. That is what we need to know when people ask us why it is not enough to just forgive us, and why did he have to come and had to be crucified? So I hope, I think uh, the things are much clearer now, especially when it comes to why did the Jews have to use blood sacrifices. That's why... Uh, we need to pay attention to uh, those questions and understand in depth why uh, we have to understand our, our faith much, much more. So let me share with you another screen so we can here. There is another question I wanted to touch today. Is God punishing us, for example, for the sins of our parents? Because I know some people have asked me this, and I think it's important to kind of give a, uh, as much as we can, some simpler answer or a catechetical answer. We can't go academic about this, but at least we will be able to kind of answer this question. I hope if you have any questions, of course, before the, the previous question we will try to answer, feel free to unmute yourself and ask me or raise your hand. We'll do that. But for now, we'll try to, again, I have my computer is a little bit slow. But I would like to uh, start here. So the question goes like this. Is God punishing us for the sins of our parents and predecessors? So when a man dies, he realizes that he's alive. And at that moment, he's anticipating either joy or fear uh, from the awaiting judgment after death. People used to say certain jokes about how some people came in front of St. Peter and they engaged in conversation with him and so on. These jokes come from the mostly Western and Roman Catholic culture. The foundation of their theology is about St. Peter and how the Lord will give only him the keys of the paradise. But many jokes start with St. Peter. However, he gave it to all the apostles, not just him, of course. 
And the Lord judges, he will, re, he will have around him all the 12 apostles to cast judgment to all of Israel, the chosen people whom the apostles preached the resurrected Christ and the good news of the kingdom of heaven. But they refuse to believe. This is a topic that requires special attention. We'll talk about that. And when we're going to talk tomorrow and in the future about the book of Revelation, we will see those 12 apostles. They play the role of the elders, a council, who will be the judges of the the tribes of Israel and of the whole world. But we'll discuss this uh, some other time in, in some of our catechism classes. But let us imagine, for example, let's say I as a priest uh, come before St. Peter now and he might say to me, well, oh, you priest, you are lazy in your service. You did not work enough on your ministry. I don't know what we're going to do with you now. In that moment, I keep pulling some tricks and justifications. I might to defend myself. I might choose to say, well, my dear apostle, you know, maybe that's true, but I was able to at least make some people, I don't know, read the scriptures or to teach them how to pray or something like that. He might respond, well, that's not possible. And while checking the archives of my life, let's say, or something in a way, I might be doomed here, if you know what I mean. For if I can't find salvation that is also dependent on you and your life for me and the others, Meaning, if I was not able to teach you or to give myself fully to, to my brother and to my sister to do some of the things, then I have failed, and that's all. Meaning that we don't save ourselves in some mechanical way. If, um, let's say, we earn the salvation, quote-unquote, but my brother and my sister that I grew up with, or I spend my, the most of my time in church, they uh, are doomed to hell, what kind of joy can we find in the kingdom of heaven? Anyway, let's move on. Um, have you ever seen someone blind from his birth, but not on TV, but in real life? Uh, if so, have you ever had any questions, for example, about his condition? What might have been your thoughts? Maybe why this person was, let's say, born blind? How can he be born blind? Why? Whose fault is it? Is this a fault maybe of his parents or some, something third? It's a very logical question. Or someone, let's say, who was paralyzed. If you remember in the gospel reading, even the apostles were asking the same question as we would do. Let us read the chapter so we can get into the topic today and try to answer the question we posted for, for today. And this is the chapter also that we read later in the, the Pascalia in, in the year. We, we usually read throughout the year this, this chapter. This is according to John chapter 9. And it uh, goes like this. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. The words meant this word meant sent. So that so the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes or clay. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. And then the Pharisees investigated the healing. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. They turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? 
We know he's your son. He, we know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That, is, that was why his parents said, he is of age, ask them. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are, the, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this man, this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Then the gospel continues. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, uh, sir, that the man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. The man, uh, then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. When the apostles were with Christ at the bath of Siloam, or the pool of Siloam, uh, Today, the Bath of Siloam is still there in Jerusalem, but uh, it's not at the same size as it used to be. But they have found the, the, the spring of the water from the Siloam because it's still there. Uh, so when the apostles were with Christ at that place, he cured the paralytic first. And if you remember, he said to him, get up, arise, and sin no more so you will not get worse. Of course, the apostles heard this. And they concluded that he was sick because of his sinfulness. And if he does not sin anymore, he will be fine. This is very important to understand of the Jewish culture. And even to this very day, people refer certain physical um, maladies or uh, physical impediments because of the sinful nature, either of the person or maybe of his parents or some sort of curse and so forth. It sometimes can also be borderline superstition. So it looked like this is was uh, this uh, that it, this was the sin which caused the condition. He's blind. So when they saw the born blind man, their logic tells them that since this man was born blind, it meant that probably it was his parents who fell into sin if he didn't commit the sins. And now their son is taking upon himself their transgression, and that is why uh, he was born blind. However, Christ opens a third option, and here we're locked on very difficult question. The question we want to answer is. Are we guilty or responsible for the sins of our parents? And this is something that we need to uh, uh, answer. This is a very important question uh, because you might be asked by a lot of people who call themselves atheists or agnostics and so forth. And they say, if Adam and Eve have committed the sin and because of that inherited death and became mortal, why would we then have to have the same burden of sin on us? Why is it our fault? The true answer is no. However, the truth is that even though we no longer are guilty of the sins of the behaviors and the actions of our parents, we still carry the consequences of their sin. We can feel those consequences. For example, 
Let's say there is a baptism of a child and glory to God that the parents have baptized it. But it happens that the parents do not work with their child on raising him in the church as they should and as the canons and the nature of things uh, put in order. You know this. Sometimes we very often use the words nominal Christians, cradle Christians. You know, people were born but never raised in the Christian faith. They were, I mean, born. They were baptized as babies, but their parents never took the children to their children to church, never teach them uh, how to read the Bible or to pray, not to commune with Christ and the liturgy and so on and so forth. And that little flicker of grace that the child received during the bapt his baptism, if it's not kindled with a fire of faith, it starts to wither away and slowly to distinguish itself. The child is not guilty for it, but it suffers the consequences of his parents' unseriousness regarding the grace of baptism and upbringing, raising the, the, the child in the church. God forbid if, this, if his parents are thieves or criminals, as he grows up, he will learn to become like his parents and lose the initial grace received from the holy baptism. The child did not choose that, but he will receive that mindset, that phronima, and he will feel the consequences of that upbringing. In the meantime, we too have continued continue to sin as our uh, parents, uh, four parents, Adam and Eve. And we did not learn a lesson from them. And we continue to bestow upon us even greater sins and greater mortality because of it. Repeating what they did in case we have a personal responsibility, we feel the consequences of the sins of our parents because we are organically, of course, connected. But the Lord answers, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God may be displayed in him. What does it mean? This, this is the, what we call the third option that God is giving. Christ is doing this so that many people can learn that no one before him healed or cured a born blind man. And so that many can believe and be saved in this case. This event will influence many. When we see a person who has such a cross, let's say someone who was either born blind or deaf or does not have a limb, a hand or a leg and so on, we start to think with thankfulness for what we have when we compare ourselves to that person because before that we were probably taking it for granted what we had or, or we were born with. We say glory to the old God, at least, I don't know, I have two hands and two legs. Because when we see a person who does not have what we have, we understand how terrible it is when you don't have what you have. Then we start to understand how the ability to see, to hear, to walk, to function is so important and what an amazing gift it is. It reminds me of St. Paisius who used to say to some people that sometimes he finds gratefulness to God that he made him a human and not a lizard or some other creature. When someone asks him, get on the Paisius, how do you acquire the mind of humility before you sit down and pray, because the preparation of, for prayer is very important. And he said, well, I thank God that I'm not a, uh, when he created me, he created me to be a human being and not a, I don't know, an ant or a worm or, or a flower, but he allowed me to be a, a, a human being. This is how he was acquiring humility and prepared himself for prayer. You see how much we learn from those people who don't have what we have and how we very often take that for granted. The people with such difficult crosses to bear, we see the amazing gifts God has granted us with. Through these people, the, work, the works of the Lord are made manifest. Sometimes it is obvious and sometimes it is hidden. If you remember the story about the poor father and his son who had one horse, I'll, I'll give you the example, but we talked about that, uh, I think, when his neighbor would come to him all the time and, and tell him, oh, poor you, now you lost your horse. Uh, then the horse came back with another five horses. Then he said, uh, then his son had an injury, had an accident, and he, oh, poor you, man, now you lost your son. So what if you have the horses? How are you going to feed yourself when you lost your precious son? He cannot help you with, uh, with, it, with your fields and whatnot. And then there was a, a recruitment into the army. And um, his son was not taken because he was hurt by the by this accident. But anyway, one older priest once said, when my children were very small, 
very often I talk to them about God, but when they grew up, I talk very often to God about them. That is what uh, was left for me, to talk to God often, regardless. This time, something extraordinary happens with the story from the gospel. Usually, the Lord would say a word, and the miracle or healing would happen right away. However, this time, he sped on the ground, made play with his spit. Then he anointed the eyes of this man and told him to wash himself in the bath of Siloam, as, as we see. The question is, why did the Lord anoint his eyes? Couldn't he just say the words like before and make him see? Why is he sending him uh, to Siloam? Why is he uh, doing that? It is true that the Lord left medicines in nature as well. We have many examples of this. That's one answer for sure. But the other answer is that he, through that clay, he's telling us that we are all created out of clay, out of, out of dirt. I am the same creator from the very beginning, has created you from the same material. With it, we see how the Lord first opens the physical eyes. And only after that, he does something that is difficult for us to understand, and that is to open his spiritual eyes. And when this spiritual opening of the eyes is truly happening, only when we start to listen to God. Not only to believe, because even the demons believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They even call him the son of David or the son of God. And they tremble of fear before him, but would not listen to him and be obedient. That is why he's sending him to Siloam to teach him obedience so he can spiritually awake. Why would we need faith if we're not to listen to the Lord's commandments and to do whatever he wants us from us to do. We see this in every so-called church that get, gets formed every day, like mushrooms, where everyone does something according to his own merit. Anyway, in Jerusalem, the bath of Siloam has a very interesting story. The reason why it is called Siloam in Hebrew, it means the, the sent one, uh, one who has is sent by someone, for example, Siloam. At one point, Jerusalem was surrounded by enemies. At that time, Jerusalem had city walls for defense purposes. When you attack a city in those times, you first encircle it and surround it and wait for the city to fall. You basically exhaust the, the people who are inside of the, the city walls. Because the people inside, of course, will get thirsty and hungry. They must surrender. So the Israelites inside were in danger to be left without water during the siege. But the Lord in the middle of Jerusalem sent them water. That's why it's called Siloam. The Lord sent water. This is the meaning of the name. The Lord teaches them that he is not only now with them during the healing of the born blind man, but he was always in the past as well. The Siloam water is his work. I was giving you this water before your healing. Now, not, not just now. So now that I am thy God, you have forgotten this. That is why he's sending him to this water to wash himself, to the, to the uh, pool of Silo. The Pharisees, of course, when they saw what happened, and this is something that we need to uh, talk about a little bit more. Let's think about this for a moment. This born blind man was known to everyone. Imagine if we had someone like this man, and I don't know, in our city or in our neighborhood, Everyone would know about this person. Or let's see, if it's a village, everybody knows everyone, small town and so forth. And suddenly this man who was born blind, everybody knew him that, or paralytic, now he can see again. Those who call themselves atheists and agnostics and intellectuals and scientists, even if they see this, many of them would be skeptical and would try to find scientific explanation for this phenomenon, as they would probably call it. They would try to examine it, take him to a hospital, do x-rays, maybe test his sanity and put him under psychiatric observance because it's not possible someone who was blind to be uh, to see again. Or he was, was he really born blind? Or he was just faking it or, or something like that. This is not possible. This must be some mistake. Someone is lying here. This is not logical, not possible, and so on. Say when the Pharisees take him, took him and, and treat him with uh, dishonor. The Lord also shows how evil we can be sometimes. The Lord gives them a witness and signs, and those who are against the church can witness many signs from the Lord. But they, instead of accepting the miracle, they can even get enforced in their efforts to go against God and his church. We see this through the conversation that these Pharisees had with the healing, with the healed blind man. They're the ones who fast and pray 
But truly, they are the ones who know the law of the Lord. They were the teachers of, of, of the people. They are the educated ones. And at the same time, they're full of anger against Christ. They even, they say, well, this man obviously is not a prophet because he performed this miracle on, on Sabbath. So he must be some heretic or someone who, uh, uh, of course, it's not standing in truth. That's why the Lord says, your sacrifices means nothing to me. I need your heart, not your thoughts and your wishes, your fantasies. The story continues when we see how they call the parents of this blind man. They go to the very end of this case. They must have a confirmation. So when the parents arrived, they started to blackmail him. If they say that he was indeed born blind and he confesses that it was Christ who healed him, they will excommunicate him from the synagogue. And of course, in those times, but even today, of course, uh, that will be a very serious thing. Imagine if someone evicts you from the community. Uh, you will be stigmatized, marked as someone who is unwelcome, suspicious, unclean in some way. So the parents feel, felt that pressure. If they say he was bl uh, bl uh, blind from birth, they will be excommunicated. And if they say no, they will have to lie. Because they did not want it to lie, they said, well, he's a grown man. Ask him. In the meantime, this man was able to see spiritually. We can see this from the conversation he had with the Pharisees and how brave he was. They said to that man, they said that that man, uh, meaning uh, Christ Jesus, is sinful. He said, whether he is sinful or not, I don't know. But I know that no one ever saw or heard that a sinful man can open the eyes of a born blind man. Unless you want to become his disciples, he asked. Uh, that made, the, of course, the Pharisees even angrier uh, than before. They, you were all born in sins and how dare you teach us, they said. And we saw how the Lord also saw, we saw how he never imposes himself on us. After all the drama, they both met again after the healing, after the conversation with the Pharisees and everything. When you go against the establishment or against those who are in power, you will be immediately exposed as a sinner and someone who is not to be trusted. This is also relevant in our times. However, when they meet, when they met, he gets one very simple question. Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answers, but who is he so I can believe in him? Here, this is very important, our Lord is very humble. He does not say, I am, but rather, you talked to him and he brought back your sight. He does not want to be direct, but he's leaving space for his freedom. He does not impose himself on us. He's leaving to think, to understand, to come by ourselves to the conclusion. Of course, then the born blind man said, I believe, O Lord, and he bowed down to him as literally says in the gospel because as we know those who truly want to worship god they will bow down bow down to god in spirit and in truth those who are truly god seekers so here's an example of a true worshiper of the lord his pride that we all have in some way vanish and in this maybe example of the of this gospel reading and this small uh, but uh, kind of short interpretation of it interpretation of it we can see that that yes, it is true that sins play a role into our physical um, inconsistencies or physical um, maladies and illnesses and, and certain tragedies. But also, we have to understand that uh, even though, let's say, the children uh, are born healthy or his parents baptize the children and so forth. If they don't grow, if they don't raise those children in the church, in the faith, then the consequences of the sinful life of the parents can be lasting uh, for, the, uh, for the children as well. There was one example I remember St. Paisia said uh, how, um, or no, this is St. Porfirius, Caps of Calivit, how this uh, parents brought uh, to him his uh, two young sons for confession and how the first son was actually pure, basically. He didn't have almost anything to confess. But the second son, the younger one, he had a lot of issues. And uh, 
it was truly a mystery why why did it happen there were church going people and so forth but then after he confessed the parents he realized that actually the parents when they were uh, pregnant with the second son they did not live um, a pure life they lived in sin and kind of uh, the baby uh, the, the their child inherited the passions of their fathers and and uh, they they were they had a bad trouble so it took some time for their repentance for their repentance so yes it is true that some things we inherit but also, we have to look in the third option that Christ is giving us, that for our repentance and for our humility, God allows certain things to him so his glory can be manifested. So anyway, I hope today we, we try to kind of at least answer these two questions. Why is animal blood used in the Old Testament? Why did God not just forgive our sins, but he had to be crucified and go through the whole drama that, of course, in the coming days we will have to we will celebrate, we will venerate. Uh, before Pascha, and is God punishing us for the sins of our parents and fetus? No, God is not punishing us, punishing us. We are punishing ourselves every time when we live in disobedience from our Lord. So that will be all for uh, for today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute and ask. But uh, if not, then we can wrap it up for uh, for today. Tomorrow, God willing, we will continue with the with the book of Revelation. Then we'll have uh, just uh, the following week, uh, Monday and Tuesday, catechism and, and Bible studies, but then we'll take a break uh, for the following few weeks because uh, we have a lot of services before and after Pascha. Of course, it's, if, if it's anything not clear or not understandable, please, if you have more questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll uh We'll stop here. We'll say the prayer. Uh, it's already seven o'clock, so we can uh, continue tomorrow with our uh, book of Revelation. Tomorrow we will talk about the letter to Pergamos. We will learn what the white stones mean uh, and what is the message of Christ to the church of Pergamos. And as slowly we progress to these letters, Christ gives to, to the Saint John the theologian to the, the seven churches of Ephesus of the book of Revelation. We will learn more and more and more interesting uh, topics that we're, will be open for us to kind of explore, discuss, and we will see how relative, relatable is to all of us and how actual is for the time that we live in today. So glory to God for that. Let's say the prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, both now and the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.